One of my favorite movies is the 2000 film entitled, O oh Brother, Where Art Thou? <laughs> Have any of y'all watched that before? We've got a couple of fan favorites there. It's inspired by Homer's epic Greek, Greek poem, The Odyssey. It's a, a story of a trio of convicts escaping from their imprisonment in 1930s rural south, only to encounter trials and tribulations on their journey as they seek out fabled hidden treasure and ultimately a return home. There's one beautiful and at the same time comedic scene. The trio encounters a group of Christian worshipers who are headed to a river to be baptized while singing down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Now, one of the escaped prisoners named Delmar, caught up in the spiritually charged experience of all that's taking place, excitedly plunges into the river to join the believers as he himself is likewise baptized. Delmar says, well, that's it, boys. I've been redeemed. The preacher's done washed away all my sins and transgressions. It's the straight and narrow from here on out. And heaven everlasting's my reward. Neither God nor man's got nothing on me. Come on in, boys. The water is fine. Today, as we continue our sermon series on how God envisions the new church, I'd like for us to reflect on this notion of conversion in one's life and the life of the church, especially First Presbyterian. Now, conversion is sometimes hard to articulate for us as many of us as lifelong Christians. We try to make it look or sound easy like a dramatic baptism in a movie scene. But the reality is that conversion is often much more complex and arduous than we'd like it to be. Is conversion something that happens all of a sudden in an instant? Or can we experience conversion over a period of time? Perhaps a lifetime. Some of us here today may have no trouble at all remembering a time of conversion. Some of us have some really wonderfully unique and original stories and powerful stories to share. But for many of us, we're left pondering if, well, if we ever have experienced conversion as ones who have been baptized as infants, for example, and raised in the comforts of an otherwise loving and supportive church body. So maybe we're left to ponder ourselves, what are the foundational elements of conversion today? Is there room to perhaps reinterpret this idea of conversion for those who already identify themselves as Christians? And maybe more specifically for this congregation, how is First Presbyterian invited into conversion today. So again, we're reading from the book of Acts. Uh, Some of it called the Acts of the Apostles. Others may refer to it as the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And we're in chapter 9 today. And just last week we read from chapter 8. We read about Philip's encounter in Samaria as he shares the good news of the risen Jesus with the Samaritans and then with the Ethiopian eunuch and the wonderful story of conversion that occurred through those works of the Holy Spirit. And today we read about one of the most dramatic conversion stories within the story of Acts. The the Spirit had to summon up some sort of extra Holy Ghost power for this one, friends, as the feared Saul, persecutor and murderer of the disciples of Jesus, presents the most powerful works of the Holy Spirit needed yet. 
Saul, the, the brash Pharisee from Tarsus, we learn, is first introduced in Acts as one witnesses, witnessing and perhaps overseeing the execution, the, the stoning of the apostle Stephen in chapter 7. And Saul's reputation precedes him, especially his, his violence and persecution toward men and women of the church, also known as the way we read about in chapter 9. And this is where we pick up. Saul is on his way to Damascus, a, a long way away from Jerusalem. If you uh, look at it in terms of mileage or day-to-day -day travel on foot, it seems that this good news of Jesus has begun to spread throughout the entire region at this point. And Saul feels it's his duty to stomp out these fires wherever they may pop up and to stop this radical group of heretics known as the way. He seeks to track down and arrest, or perhaps even worse, anyone who desires to dare to challenge this institution of the Jewish law by proclaiming the news of this resurrected Jesus. And our author Luke describes Saul in such a way as if his persecution of the Christians is personal, as if his very identity is threatened by the mere presence of such an ideology and belief as the resurrection of Jesus as the Christ. And that is exactly what happens. Saul's very life and identity is forever changed in encountering the risen Christ. Saul is blinded by a flash of light and thrown to the ground. No alternative messenger will do in this moment. No, the risen Jesus himself speaks directly to Saul. It seems that God has a plan for this zealous man. God has something to teach him. Now sometimes we resist God's plans and we're sent nudges, perhaps over a period of time, to guide us along the way. In other times, friends, well, God needs to knock us to the ground so that we are ready to listen. This was Saul's personal experience to go through with God. His, his companions along the way were there for this event, and yet they did not experience what Saul experienced in that moment. You know when people talk about having this come-to-Jesus meeting? Well, this was literally the sense for Paul. And while this dramatic event is taking place outside of Damascus, God is also moving within the life of a disciple named Ananias inside the city as well. Ananias also has a role to play in the story. While Ananias is understandably fearful at first when God presents this plan to him, he is faithful and obedient in fulfilling his role. He is to go to this man named Saul, who is known to persecute Christians like Ananias. And Ananias will trust in God's movement and will confront this tyrant named Saul. Ananias will tell Saul all that God is doing in his life. Saul, God says, is to be an integral part of the works of the kingdom. Verse 15 reads, For he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, once again, Ananias will lay hands on Saul, as Saul's vision will be restored. He will be baptized, and he will be reborn to no longer persecute the witnesses of the resurrection, but to become one of the prominent leaders of this new church. Come on in, boys. The water is fine. Saul will be reborn to whom we like to refer to as Paul. He will go on to become one of the most outspoken messengers and witnesses of the resurrected Jesus. Saul experienced conversion on that day. 
And today is good news for us. God moves in this world to convert our hearts toward Christ so that we too may experience rebirth in the Spirit. My question for us today is do you believe it? Do you believe that the Holy Spirit can move within us and transform our very identities toward Christ? And do you also believe that God seeks to use us as a vessel, as an instrument as well, to share the good news of resurrection with the world and to journey alongside others as they experience their own conversions? As we profess Christ resurrected, we also profess the Spirit being able to do nothing short of changing entire lives and communities including the lives of you and me. Conversion, friends, is life-changing. But it's not something that we can just do on our own. It begins with Christ moving within our very lives. And sometimes this means us inviting Jesus into our lives. Other times this means Jesus, well, making his presence known in one way or another. With baptism as our outward expression of such an inward grace, we're called to spiritually die to our old self and to be reborn in the Spirit, to become, in the words of the Apostle Paul, new creations. And within this spiritual rebirth, the very faith community which we identify with is called to support and nurture the converted into such a new identity. In effect, the church is likewise invited into conversion as we seek to reflect new identity through Jesus Christ for the world. We may call it renewal, we may call it revival, but we are called nonetheless. Sisters and brothers, I believe that each of us and experience conversion within our lives. And it's not just a one-time deal. And I believe that conversion can extend to this entire congregation here at First Presbyterian because it's not just a one-time deal. We are called to new life time and time again. As we are reminded, the Spirit moves where it pleases And if the Spirit is powerful enough to blind a zealous Pharisee, to bring a murderous tyrant to his knees, then I believe the Spirit can work with us as well. Friends, what can it look like to be converted in the presence of the risen Christ here today? What can it look like as scales perhaps need to be removed from our own eyes so that we can see the world as Jesus sees it? What words of new life do we need to share with our neighbors? And what words do we perhaps need to hear ourselves? Come, Holy Spirit, come. And convert our hearts toward your will. Come, Holy Spirit, come and convert our tired bodies into energized instruments for your works. Come, Holy Spirit, come and convert this church and this entire community to be a light into the spiritual blindness of this world so that Christ's glory may be revealed and all may come to experience the love and grace of our Creator.